The city of New Orleans was founded in 1718 by a guy named Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne de Bienville, which is a name I challenge you to say while intoxicated. Bienville came here with about uh, 30 convicts. They sailed uh, over into Lake Pontchartrain, went down Bayou St. John, got off of their boats, and they took an old Native American trail basically to this spot, or very near to it, you know, in what is today the French Quarter. And they founded the city. And what I mean by that is that they uh, cleared away the cane break and drove away the buffalo that were living here. And that's what passed for founding the city back in 1718, I suppose. And they called it the city, even at the very beginning, even though it was very much not a city. In fact, one visitor in 1730 said that the biggest buildings in New Orleans would have been unremarkable in a French village. So this is pretty much just a colonial backwater for the first uh, several decades. But that started to change, you know, around the mid-18th century. It wasn't a question of, you know, if this city was going to make any money, but when. It's very well positioned right here at the mouth of the Mississippi, you know, connecting the North American world of trade with the Atlantic world. But the irony is, for all the hard work the French into sort of carving out a habitable settlement here, uh, they actually made very little money off of it. Because in 1762, we became a Spanish colony. Spanish, uh, they got Louisiana as part of the Treaty of Fontainebleau. France secretly ceded Louisiana to them. And uh, the following year, Spanish governor got off the boat, you know, just a couple feet that way, said, uh, hello, everyone, you're Spanish now. And uh, everyone here said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you wouldn't know about it because it was a secret, but trust me, you are. You are subjects of the Spanish king. And nobody here liked that very much, so they chased him back onto his boat and he fled back to Havana with his tail between his legs. However, the Spanish would return a couple years later. They came with a 2,000-man army under the command of a new governor, a fellow with a very Spanish-sounding name. His name was Don Alejandro O'Reilly. He was an Irish mercenary working for the King of Spain. And Bloody O'Reilly, as he became known, really earned that nickname. Uh, there were still some French insurrectionists here, you know, people who very want, much wanted to be a French uh, colony once again, and uh, they were willing to resort to violence to achieve this. So O'Reilly said, all right, it's fine, we can talk about this like civilized people. He invited all the insurrectionists to dinner and then literally took them out back and shot them. There's a plaque over by the old U.S. Mint down the, over that way on Decatur. It says, this is where French patriots died pretty ruthless way to enter into power here into the city. Uh, but the Spanish did leave one major legacy, which is visible even today. And I mean, you know, I'm standing on it, basically. I'm talking about the modern day French Quarter, because the city burned down, first in 1788 and then again in 1794. And the Spanish took what had been a city of cypress wood and rebuilt it in brick, giving us kind of the quintessential French Quarter architecture that we know and love today. You walk around this neighborhood, you see a lot of wrought iron galleries, uh, hanging gardens, brickwork in many of these buildings. Nothing even remotely French about that architecture. It's very Spanish colonial. And Havana, Cuba, San Juan, Puerto Rico, a lot of these sorts of places have very similar flares to their architecture. There are, in fact, only two French buildings even left in the French Quarter today. So the Spanish held on to Louisiana until 1803. Napoleon Bonaparte was all up in the Iberian Peninsula around that time. He was all up in there. And so he and Spain were actually technically allies, but uh, it was very much an abusive relationship and eventually Napoleon just put his brother Joseph on the throne and uh, he ended up getting Louisiana back. But by the time the transfer of power had been formalized, Napoleon had very much changed his mind. He decided he really didn't need this huge tract of land here in North America. What he had much more use for was money to fund his war machine. So he decided to basically sell Louisiana off to the first person willing to buy it. Ended up, of course, being Thomas Jefferson, President of the United States. So, funny thing about the Louisiana Purchase, you know, Thomas Jefferson, his whole political philosophy was all about small government, right? He thought it'd be very, you know, dangerous if one man or one institution had too much power. Well, that same guy authorized the Louisiana Purchase without congressional approval. Whoops! Yeah, with one hand he does this executive unilateral action that was not really in his power to do, and then with the other he completely defunded the military. So, when we declared war on the British during the War of 1812, we declared war on the British. It was stupid. You know, the British showed up with 10,000 soldiers, the biggest navy the world had ever seen, and said, Americans, what y'all got? And we said, well, we've got some, uh, some muskets and some farmers to wield them. They're extremely well regulated, but yeah, they will run at the first sign of opportunity. Uh, the only great American victory in the War of 1812 was actually fought, you know, right here in New Orleans. Well, technically not over in Chalmette, but uh, they call it the Battle of New Orleans for some reason. So, you know, we could debate uh, all day about the legality of the Louisiana page Purchase, and I'm sure that would make thrilling viewing. But uh, in any case, it happened, and a bunch of Americans started to pour into the city. And they were entrepreneurial types, right? They wanted to make some money. But what they found here was a culture that was uniquely unsuited to that. The Creoles thought that the Americans were rustic and boorish and unhygienic and generally took life too seriously. On the other hand, of course, the uh, Americans thought that the Creoles 
were like wine sodden and vain and idolatrous and effeminate and very, you know. Biggest thing that the two sides would disagree about was how both viewed and practiced slavery had a huge impact on Louisiana history. Uh, but suffice to say that over the course of the early 19th century, what we started to see here was a very fragile social order built up based very much on race and class, one that was pretty much entirely destroyed in the aftermath of the American Civil War. Now, nobody burned New Orleans to the ground during the Civil War. Uh, there wasn't a big battle here or anything, but we did have a lot of violence after the war. Although maybe I should mention that uh, Benjamin Butler, you know, Spoons Butler, he carved uh, the Union must and shall be preserved into this Andrew Jackson statue. And that's about the biggest battle that was fought here. But after the war, during Reconstruction, uh, we had a lot of violence. You know, Reconstruction, of course, that constant sort of push and pull between Northern Republicans and Southern Democrats. And a lot of this political violence would culminate in the infamous Battle of Liberty Place, which was fought here in New Orleans during Reconstruction. Uh, and just very quickly, in 1872, there was a gubernatorial election here in Louisiana. Both the Republican and the Democratic candidates claimed victory, and neither would concede. So the Republican uh, took it upon himself to move his stuff into the governor's office, basically. Uh, he was, you know, people here in New Orleans supported him, and we were the capital of Louisiana back then. Uh, but nobody out in the countryside liked that very much at all. They were all very deeply Democrat. So about 3,000 of them got together and formed a paramilitary organization called the White League, which is exactly what it sounds like, stormed into New Orleans, killed about 100 people, and took control of City Hall for three days. Isn't that crazy? So, you know, you'd think, I mean, if, if this happened today in the post-9-11 world, there's really only one possible solution to this flagrant attack on law and order. The army would show up and murder everybody. But it was a very different world back in 1874. The army did show up, but they did not press charges on the White League. They let them go free, back to their homes. And I'm sure the White League was like, okay, oh, good deal to me, and they left. After they had killed 100 people, including a bunch of cops. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. So while all this was going on, you know, Civil War, Reconstruction, the chaos that followed, you know, and of course in the Jim Crow era began when federal troops left in 1877, uh, we had a bunch of immigrants come here to New Orleans, hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, now, of course, you know, that sort of mass wave of immigration in the late 19th century, we typically associate with like New York, Ellis Island, we've all heard these kinds of stories, but New Orleans was one of the great port cities of that day. And uh, we had mostly Germans come here in large numbers, but also Irish and Italian. And they made their own mark on New Orleans culture. There's a reason, for instance, that our uh, St. Paddy's Day celebrations are a week long here in the city. Not just an excuse to have a parade. We've got a lot of Irish folks here. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, the Italian pastry shops, German beer gardens, all that kind of stuff. So I guess that was sort of the last major ingredient. Uh, that turned the city into kind of what we would know of today, you know, sort of it created, in the modern sense at least, that New Orleans thing, right? That unique culture of Southeast Louisiana that you don't really find anywhere else in the country. <laughs> take, take your money back. <laughs>